Now I'd like to introduce uh, Roberta Washington, who is uh, a member of our board and a very noted architect as well. Used to be on uh, the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission, and she will be moderating the second panel. Roberta, it's all yours. So the morning, this morning session, uh, was really exciting, I thought, and I thought that it gives us a really good understanding of what it is that we have to lose if we don't make what we're trying to do work, right? And what we're trying to do is to save the physical evidence of the history of Harlem, right? Um, the architecture, um, the buildings are all important, but they're important uh, because of what they represent. In this section, we're going to be talking about the urgency, doing the urgency, doing what needs to be done, and closing the preservation gap in Harlem. But also, we're talking about uh, we can't get away from uh, the history and and the, and why the buildings um, that we are trying to save are important. And I think that the session this morning made it clear that history and preservation uh, in Harlem uh, go together. And that the only way we can advance is by turning to preservation and making it a key factor in our um, redevelopment of communities. We have three speakers in this session. Um, and the first is Kevin Magruder, who is Associate Professor of History at Antioch College. Um, he was, and I know him uh, from a, a past life, when he was a director of real estate development with Harlem's Abyssinia Development Corporation. Um, but I also know him because he writes books that you can't help but read all the way through, even though sometimes there's so much information there that is hard to absorb it all, uh, which is why he had to write the second one to make the first one even easier to, to comprehend. And once you got used to it, then you just want it more. And, and so um, Kevin is going to be doing his presentation um, to talk about um, history. It's, yes, it also talks about like what has to be done. But it is also more current um, or more recent than the history that we started with this morning. And I think that once he's done his presentation, um, we'll have a, fill, a fuller understanding of where real estate um, and development and the importance of it um, got started in Harlem and how it came to be that now um, we have to look back at that to understand the future. So I'd like to say, Kevin, hi. Hi, Kevin. Sorry about that. One is a book that I wrote. It came out in 2015. It's called Race and Real Estate, Conflict and Cooperation in Harlem, 1890 to 1920. And then the follow-up is a book uh, that came out last year. It's called Philip Payton, The Father of Black Harlem. And so what I want to do uh, for a few minutes is take you through some of the information that I present in that because you'll see there's a through line to the early 20th century and some of the challenges that we are facing in preserving important buildings in Harlem now. Um, if you could go to the first slide, uh, the next one, please. Thank you. Um, black people were in Harlem, and you may have heard that with this morning's presentation, um, probably going back to the 1600s. Uh, they were in small numbers. Um, in the 1890s, there was a small black enclave uh, in the area where Lenox Terrace is now on 135th, 134th, 
133rd streets between Lenox and Fifth Avenue. Kevin, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there are slides that are, sh okay, they're here now. Okay, okay, very good. Sorry, continue. Uh, oh, no problem. And so there was a, a African-American enclave in the area of 135th, 134th, 133rd streets between Lenox and Fifth Avenue. I'm not sure how well you can see that map, but I'll try to point to it. This area, it was called Little Africa on maps. Um, and it kind of follows the Little Africa community that had been in Greenwich Village around Thompson Street. And when we think about, well, how did that come to be? Uh, some practices that we see later in the 20th century are probably part of it, that the majority of the black community in the 1890s was in the area of Midtown. It was called the Tenderloin, uh, roughly between 23rd Street to um, the high 40s. And in the, the northern area, eventually became known as San Juan Hill. And that's 50s um, up to maybe Columbus Circle into the 60s. Um, but black people did have this enclave in Harlem. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? That peaceful, at least what looks like peaceful, when you look at historical records, begins to change, uh, particularly in 1904. Uh, in the spring of 1904, a white-led real estate company, the Hudson Realty, company. They had purchased several properties that were occupied on the 135th Street site. And then on the other side of 135th Street, where Harlem Hospital is now, that was vacant land. They purchased that as well. They issued eviction notices for many of the people in the properties they owned on the 135th Street side. And there was an outcry from the Black residents of those buildings and they organized to try to fight it and i haven't been able to determine if they actually were evicted but what we do know is that the man on the left side of this slide philip payton had an important role in anchoring black people in harlem when this attempt was happening he marshaled black entrepreneurs to invest in real estate in this area. And there were some white property owners in the area who helped him to buy property. They took back mortgages. And by the latter part of 1904, he had incorporated the Afro-American Realty Company and was raising money uh, to continue finding spaces for African-Americans. The black population in Harlem in that first decade of the 1900s is growing dramatically. And it really outstripped the space available in the Tenderloin area. So Harlem was a natural place for them to go. The other factor behind that eviction notice is that the Lenox Avenue subway line was scheduled to open in the fall of 1904. And that's what we believe is behind Hudson Realty's attempt to assemble this property evict the black tenants and they probably had an idea that they were going to build for a higher quote what they call a higher and better use. Peyton foils that attempt and eventually Hudson Realty sells their properties and that opens the door for the Afro-American Realty Company to continue their their work with bringing black people to Harlem. Uh, can you move to the next slide please? The next decade Harlem is you might say in play or there's tensions um underneath this eviction effort is a growing hostility toward black people in the north as their numbers in cities like new york um chicago detroit as they increase and in harlem that plays out to a kind of pivot from trying to evict black people to containing them. And the idea that they, in the newspapers at the time, is that they're gonna keep black people east of Lenox Avenue, and they even called it the deadline. They, there was a proposal to build a fence along Lenox Avenue, it never happened. But what they do is begin placing racial restrictive covenants in deeds on various blocks. 
And this map of that, that same area that the uh, earlier slide showed uh, shows different restrictive covenants on blocks, roughly between 135th and 140th Street, between 7th and 5th Avenue. And this is happening in a four year period from 1907 to 1911. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? That process was unsuccessful in part because white people's hostility, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy for them that what they, behind that hostility, they had developed the notion that the presence of black people brought crime, brought lower property values, the trope that we still hear today. And, but as black people became successful in moving to neighborhoods, because that belief had been kind of drilled into people, often the white people on blocks, uh, the sky had fallen and they start fleeing from Harlem and that opens the door for more black people to come. When we look nationally as what's, at what's happening in the real estate industry, it's professionalizing and they create the National Association of Real, real Estate Boards. And in 1924, in their code of ethics, um, what this slide, the title I have on this slide is they write race into real estate. And I'm really kind of amending a term that Khalil Muhammad uh, used in his book, The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Urban America, where he talks about how in the latter decades of the 1800s, race is written into crime. And that's what this code does. And this article 24 says a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. By this time, there's a substantial number of Black people in the area that we now call Central Harlem. And that's really who they're talking about. This is a national organization. Um, and, and in many cities by this time, there is antagonism toward Black people who are moving there. And so that gets built into the real estate industry, that there's something wrong with Black people living where white people are. And if we look below that and and their justification for it, they continue the idea that the presence of Black people lowers property values. When we think about real estate valuation, one element of it is what the bricks and mortar are worth, but the other element is what people believe they're worth. And so if people believe the property is worth less, then that often becomes a reality. Um, there's a book called Negroes in Cities by Carl and Alma Tuber that was written in the 60s. And they look at what happened when Black people moved into predominantly white neighborhoods. And it often followed a process where the property values did go down initially, but then they begin to go up almost immediately. And because, and the reason they're going up is because the demand that Black people are being steered to these neighborhoods. They were steered to Harlem. Like if you look at the map of Manhattan, the logical place for them to go after the Tenderloin would have been the Upper West Side. The Upper West Side was under development in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And because they weren't able to go there, they, they get steered to Harlem. And so that's what these practices, they keep the real estate brokers keep Black people out of certain neighborhoods and steer them to others. The other way this was written into um, real estate is that the term realtor is what this organization eventually calls themselves. And Black people could not join it and they could not use that term. And Black people in the 40s, Black real estate agents formed their own organization. And so there's a way that race, property valuation is a backdrop for all of this. And uh, can you move to the next slide, please? And so that was the 1920s. By the 1930s, the federal government 
gets in on this uh, notion that Black people um, lower the property values then. And you're probably familiar that during the Depression, uh, the economic downturn um, devastates the housing market. And real estate financing at that time was relatively short term. If you were buying a house, often you paid 50% down you had an interest only mortgage for 10 years. And after the end of that 10 years, you either paid the balance, you refinanced it and rolled it over into another one, or you sold it so you could pay off the balance. When the depression happens, many of those mortgages get called. Many of the banks that had the mortgages went under. People are out on the streets and the federal government is looking at how can they stabilize the housing market. And the what we kind of take for granted now, the self-amortizing loan, where we pay interest and principal over a long period of time, it comes into existence because of federal government intervention. So a 25-year loan or a 30-year loan, that was rare before this. And the way the federal government makes that a feasible economic um uh, calculation is by providing mortgage insurance. So the banks are not used to making loans of that length. Federal government uh, creates a mortgage insurance program saying, banker, you make the loan. If the borrower can't pay it, we will insure it and we will pay it. You can draw on that insurance. And to do that, they rated all of the country. <laughs> the real estate markets throughout the country uh, in terms of risk. And the way they ex assess risk goes back to that 1924 uh, real estate code of ethics that predominantly black areas were seen as highest risk and they were red, um, areas where there might be a few black people or maybe Latino people uh, were moderate risk and areas where there were majority white would be the strongest areas. And so the term redlining comes from that because that was how the maps were color coded. And it had broader implications than the federal government. So what that meant was that capital financing to renovate a home, to buy homes, was not available in those neighborhoods. And this is showing the redlining map for upper Manhattan. And you can see that most of Harlem is, is red in this map. And the kind of financing that people who did own property in that area would have available would have been higher interest, probably shorter terms, higher risk. And so what that means, if you owned a, let's say a, a brownstone, uh, in Harlem is that you're probably taking in rumor, rumors to cover this higher cost of your debt. Um, and if you lose your job, then you're at risk of losing that property. And so it makes the, the market unstable. It also it makes it harder to reinvest in properties as well. And, and that's the backdrop that we're we're living with now. And so that's the 30. So if we, you know, kind of quickly move forward through the decades, that, you know, as you know, um, what also happens probably in in the 30s and 40s and 50s, slum clearance programs happen where a lot of important properties are torn down. And the idea that there's no acknowledgement that those areas were decrepit because they were starved of capital, that the notion comes into kind of the public sense that the presence of Black people had something to do with that, even if they don't say that as, as bluntly as, as I'm saying it. And so when we look at preservation of properties in those areas, that the areas where Black people live, no matter the condition of the property, were seen as less valuable. And there's research that's been done in the last several years that really follows up on that. In 2018, Andre Perry, uh, who's with the Brookings Institute, 
he led a uh, research with uh, a couple of his colleagues that resulted in a report is called the devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods, the case of residential property. And it says homes in neighborhoods where the share of the population is 50% black are valued at roughly half the price as homes in neighborhoods with no black residents. And so if you are preservationist in a neighborhood that's 50% black, appraisers are saying it's not worth much. And I know preservation is not just talking about economic value, it's talking about historical value. But if you can't make the case of the economic value and the appraisers are not helping there, it's intertwined with you making the case of historical value, even though they're different. And that's the, the challenge that is that we're facing when we look at preservation in areas like Harlem is that there's this backdrop and part of the reason why I believe this research is important is for people to acknowledge that that is the legacy. And when we look at preservation, I, I believe an acknowledgement of that can help people to understand that there are properties in these neighborhoods that are worthy of preservation. And it's really our kind of historical legacy that has a lot to do with the fact that they haven't been preserved or it's very difficult to preserve them. And thank you very much then. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, information. Um, and uh, we'll have a chance to ask questions at the, at the end. Oh. And we'll have a chance to ask questions at the end of this seminar. Okay, our second speaker is Marina Ortez, who is a dedicated community artist and advocacy journalist specializing in creative expression and social justice. Um, she's a director, she is a director at East Harlem Preservation, a grassroots volunteer organization that works to preserve and promote local history and culture while combating gen uh, gen gentrification, uh, police brutality, and other social injustices. Um, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. Start. This is so cool. We have a screen here, so I don't have to turn my yeah. neck. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we ready to go? Yeah. My, my um, yes. Hi, so good afternoon. Um, I'm going to jump back and forth from my presentation to some comments that I prepared. So while I'm waiting for that, I uh, just want to acknowledge that we are situated on stolen land in a country that was forged by the ruthless displacement, enslavement, and genocide of black and indigenous people, including the Caribbean, where my family's from. And today, there's been a lot of talk about capital as a means of power. Um, but our organization, East Harlem Preservation, we successfully sued the city not once but twice to stop the alienation, privatization of public parkland on Randall's Island. We also forced the city to remove the statue of J. Marion Sims, and we did it all with people power. And I want to acknowledge Diane Collier is here in the room. She's the former chair of the Community Board 11, and she really pushed through you know, to, to get that resolution and support from the board, which was the impetus for de Blasio finally making that decision to remove the Sims statue. I don't know if you all know who Sims was, a butcher who experimented on black women and their infants. And so we did all of this with people power. Um, and so I want to acknowledge, yeah. And also I forgot to mention Cordell Clear, State Senator Cordell Clear was a part of our committee um, and very instrumental in helping us to get that white supremacist monument out of our community. Now we're still waiting for a replacement, but that's another story. <laughs> so the, the history and people of East Harlem are, is very similar to Central Harlem, but you know it's more become El Barrio um, because of the influx of Spanish-speaking people from the Caribbean. Um, but it's still very um, predominantly Puerto Rican, African American, and Central American, 
et cetera. So we still have a very diverse community, um, and our history goes is very similar to Central Harlem in, in terms of the settlements and the buildup. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today is to ask ourselves, what do we mean by preservation, right? What exactly are we saving and for whom? What is even the point of preservation in an eroding climate, right? For me, preservation goes way beyond tax credits, saving a landmark building, or creating a quaint historic district. Although East Harlem Preservation has certainly dipped its toes into those waters, and in fact, we were honored by the Historic Districts Council as part of their Six to Celebrate um, program in 2015. I want to acknowledge Simeon Bankoff, the former director. Um, so I see preservation as actively working to uplift my neighbors by documenting and honoring their culture, language, and history. It's about mutual respect and responsibility and working to build and defend a just and sustainable community for my family and future generations. So preservation for me is also about celebrating our ancestors with colorful murals and street dedications created by artists who actually know and live or work in our community. It's about annual parades, block parties, performances. We just, we love to party and we love to honor our ancestors. So yeah, to be sure, preservation does involve landmarks, um, historic districts and lots and lots of community-based planning. And we've had quite a few good faith efforts by local architects such as Raymond Plumet, Victor Morales, and Miguel Angel Baltierra, who all tried to incorporate a sense of community in the work that they did to restore or build um, in East Harlem. And these are some of the murals that I have personally been involved in either creating, restoring, repairing, etc. And they're all honoring uh, Puerto Rican and, and Frida, of course, from Mexico, Puerto Rican icons in the arts, in politics, and activism. And so I'm really proud of that work, and for me, that's very much a part of preservation. That's the telling of our history. East Harlem walls have always served as canvases for local artists, and so I work very hard to preserve those, which is different from murals that, you know, people come in from whatever other outside and they paint something that we have no idea what, what they're painting. And yeah, they, you know, it's, it's wonderful, they're professional, all that stuff, but it doesn't mean anything to us. They don't come and they talk, they don't come to talk to us and see what we'd like to see on those walls. So I prefer to work with artists like Manny Vega and um, activist artists uh, to do that kind of preservation work in terms of honoring our ancestors. But today, the word preservation has been transformed into a real estate buzzword. One that is, um, oh my goodness, one that is falsely touted by politicians as an effective tool for combating gentrification and displacement. As you heard, redlining and eminent domain are also some other tactics that have been used to justify our removal. So they used to call it urban renewal, and then some people call it Negro remo removal. And uh, so we've heard from other speakers about the different ways that the government and business, private business and developers work to put, put us here, and then we're gonna put you there, and we're gonna build this subway here, and we're gonna build that one there, and then we're gonna tear it down so we can be high rise and condo, all that stuff, right? But that's not for us. They plan for the future. They plan for what they would like to see there instead of us. So we do, we fight against the Second Avenue subway. Um, I don't wanna see another Seneca village where masses of black and indigenous people are rootlessly uprooted by developers who think they know better. And y'all on the community board, you know that I call you out every time, right? <laughs> we come with a new plan and promises of affordable housing. Um, yeah, so we don't look forward to a Second Avenue subway that will not serve current residents. But East Harlem also has a long history of fighting for affordable housing. In the 70s, it wasn't only the South Bronx that was burning, it was also East Harlem. And a lot of people, and some refer to the Protestant movement, in Harlem, where they were also in East Harlem and founders of the Church of the Living Hope. 
uh, work to, for, to form Hope Community and other nonprofit organizations where they renovated all of these abandoned buildings with sweat equity and then later down the road support from the city. And so that was the model for affordable housing in our community for a long time. But um, and that's some of the work they did. So, but today we hear um, the solution is gen um, rezoning. Let's rezone, rezone. We heard all of that today as well. Air rights, rezoning. Um, but those things are not decided or planned by us, really. We, we could go to a meeting and say, I want to see this, I'd like to have this, and 30% affordable. It's not really ultimately up to us unless we go down to City Hall like we did to fight the rezoning in uh, 2017. And we had collected over 3,000 petition signatures from people who were opposed to the rezoning. And some of my friends, as you can see in the bottom right hand, we went to City Hall for the final vote and we collected those petitions, we taped them together, and then we unfolded them over the balcony as a grand gesture to show the city that our community did not want to be rezoned. In fact, all of the promises that came through the East Harlem plan um, for givebacks, a lot of those promises have been broken and reneged. So when they come to you with a plan for rezoning, even if it's spot rezoning, you really, it's never usually legally um, enforceable and community boards don't have that kind of authority either so you have to push a little further than um, their presentation at your meeting so um, in the end preservation uh, should never be about what well, we've also um, sorry I shouldn't have, so we've also worked to um, preserve people's churches as I call them so we have uh, on the top left, Our Lady Queen of Angels Roman Catholic Church that was closed on February 12th, 2007. And a group of senior parishioners, these are older women, decided that they weren't leaving. They weren't having it. So they stayed in the church overnight, got arrested the next day very gently. Uh, but since then, every single Sunday morning, they come out and they have their own worship, their own uh, 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 service outside of the church. And two of the members of that campaign passed away. And with their blessing, their family had their funerals outside of the church because the church wouldn't open the doors. And the church is still there, it's vacant, it's not in use, it's in a beautiful cul-de-sac, so we know it's really prime real estate, um, but we petitioned for landmarking, we petitioned the Vatican, and nothing worked, right? Um, then on the top uh, right is the People's Church, the first United Spanish Methodist Church, which doesn't necessarily wanna be landmarked because then there are all these restrictions, right? But it is a landmark. It is where the Young Lords Party took over and created the breakfast program in the model of the Black Panther Party. Um, and today, the, the Reverend Dolimar Lebron, she is like awesome. She's bringing it back to the people. So with a lot of um, programming, block parties, and um, affirmative um, uh, uh, programs. Another option might be a community land trust, but that's another um, bag of tricks that the city has been uh, changing its mind about. So it's not really about people ownership. It's, it's more about putting our model into their affordable housing bureaucracy. So um, East Harlem Preservation, we're not the first. Um, there were efforts to create a historic district in East Harlem in 1979. And in 2003, Raymond Plumet, who's also one of our uh, founding board members, no longer on the board, he um, fought to create a historic district in the Pleasant Avenue area where they wanted to build a mall, right? Um, if you've ever been to Pleasant Avenue, it's all brownstones. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but they did get the mall built. And um, Columbia University came around in 2011 and did a study with us where they, gave, they inspired um, the idea for an historic district 
along East Harlem's 116th Street and Pleasant Avenue corridor. Then we also have individual landmark efforts that um, I haven't been involved in all of them, but Landmark East Harlem, which is a sister organization, um, has been actively doing that and also helping to realize the historic district that Raymond Plumet and Columbia University students had hoped for. So in East Harlem, we have 25, I think it's probably more, designated landmarks. Um, and that includes the Museum of the City of New York, um, what's now called the Julia de Burgos Latino Cultural Center and other beautiful buildings. Uh, that's a, the planned historic district. I don't know if that's the current one. It is? Yeah. Um, okay, so in the end, I, um, I think that preservation should never be about privatized property, about who has it or who gets it or who benefits and who gets to stay. I think it's about sharing our resources to combat overdevelopment and climate change. And I didn't talk too much about that, but our waterfront is, oof. although I do understand very, thing, very few things in the world are permanent, I strongly believe that my family and neighbors deserve to live with dignity and that we can coexist on this little sliver of land that was stolen by hostile forces bearing a few shiny trinkets. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and our final panelist in this session is Tiffany Simple, who's the principal of Simple Design Studio Architecture, PC. And she's educated both in architecture and historic preservation. Uh, she's the co-chair um, of the Association of Preservation Technologies Inclusion Advocacy Committee and, a, and is part of several advocacy organizations in the design industry. Um, Tiffany. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I'm so glad I'm actually the last uh, presenter because um, both uh, Kevin and Marlena actually set this up quite well before me talking about um, policy um, and preservation. And um, I'm gonna be speaking on the causality of preservation and gentrification. Um, as one of the few black female architects in the preservation niche um, within the building industry, um, I've been spending a lot more of my time in the past five to seven years kind of looking into this intersection between preservation and gentrification. Um, and I've presented on this a couple of times um, previously at other conferences um, and have kind of um, expanded on that uh, since that time. Um, we can switch to the next slide. Um, so as we all know, gentrification is the phenomenon of kind of displacement, um, usually when affluent or um, significantly um, wealthy businesses move into less wealthy neighborhoods, often marginalized. Um, and the existing um, homeowners or renters, residents are displaced um, throughout that process. Um, property values usually increase. Um, and then these residents are, you know, displaced and left to kind of fend for themselves and, and move to different locations. Um, and historically, this has been kind of explained into five different factors, such as demographic factors, sociocultural, um, social movements, political and economical, and community networks. That kind of breaks down all the different factors um, that go into uh, gentrification and what causes people to kind of move into these neighborhoods. Obviously, um, I'm primarily talking about um, people moving into historic neighborhoods that are, um, you know, recently designated or over time have become, you know, run down and then they all of a sudden get this new um, fresh uh, life coming in uh, with different policies that have been placed, such as rezoning, like we've discussed, um, historic designation um, and different factors. Um, we can switch to the next slide. So as we discuss this, um, this typically falls within the preservation um, policy and investment um, sector of this, instead of like people's preferences to move to a certain neighborhood or um, a reason of supply and demand. Simply there's not enough housing, so people move outward. It, it's typically um, in this situation um, more of social movements, um, political and economical reasons, and kind of investments being placed into certain neighborhoods. 
Uh, next slide, please. So as Kevin actually talked about a lot, um, a lot of redlining and things that happened in the 20s and 30s, um, specifically in Harlem, there are a lot more things that happened um, after that, uh, specifically in, in New York City. So we have the large suburban migration movement, which happened in the 50s and 60s. And within that, there was a lot of redlining, um, blockbusting, um, things of that nature. nature. Um, and we also have like um, kind of a lot of urban decay happening at that time. And then um, LPC was established in 1965, and we begin seeing um, historic districts and buildings um, being landmarked. And actually, um, Mount Morris Park West, that historic district was nominated very early. Um, that's in 1971, which we're going to discuss in a little bit um, in Harlem. But we start to see these organizations that are building up to kind of protect historic fabric within the city. And um, we start to see these incentives or credits come into play um, quite early. So 1978, uh, we have the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit. Um, 1994, we start to see the um, New York State Vacancy Decontrol. Um, 2000, uh, New Markets Tax Credit Program. Um, in 2016, we have the Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Ordinance. Um, in 2018, the Opportunity Zones Tax Incentive. So these things are all placed here, um, you know, as incentives to kind of, so they say, revitalize these neighborhoods that are going under urban decay um, or abandonment to kind of bring these neighborhoods back to life, um, et cetera. However, as um, we've kind of discussed already, like these have been put into place for very specific people. Um, in an effort to increase not only the, you know, historic fabric in the buildings and development, um, we start to see a lot of new business development. We see a lot of increased interest from developers and investors and not necessarily a lot of programs and more importantly, education um, and benefits to residents who already live in these neighborhoods. Um, next slide. So as I started to do this, I, I wanted to kind of isolate um, historic districts um, as a factor and kind of see how that fit into the relationship um, between preservation and gentrification. Um, often preservation and, and investment policies, as we've discussed, can be a causal factor for gentrification, um, not because it's a direct cause um, or, you know, this is a linear thing that's defined, but um, just because of its role in this um, larger context. So we can't look at preservation only by its, um, you know, goals and practices within, within this lens. We have to look at the bigger picture. And it's not this dichotomy where, you know, two separate things are happening um, in a neighborhood that aren't related. You have to look at how all of these initiatives spark other things um, and it becomes more of a dynamic interrelationship. So if we look at the next slide, we can kind of see how all of these things um, start to shape other items. You know, we, we look at historic districts and how, yes, we're saving this fabric. Um, we are thinking of this as rehabbing the property, you know, increasing the property values and, and being able to give people tax credits. Those are all great things. But we also have to look at other factors that are coming into play around this. Like within doing that, are we also providing people with the education to take care of these homes? Are we also providing people with the ability to own these homes instead of new development coming in and, and displacing them? Um, are we also looking at you know, all of these factors that that come into play and could be the negative, you know, spin side of, of things that we're starting, which are typically positive um, things that we're creating through policy. If we go to the next slide. So when I started doing all of this, I um, basically looked at New York City, um, just because I'm, I'm most familiar with um, New York City. Uh, they have the oldest, um, you know, municipal preservation agency in the country, as well as the largest. Um, and there's a lot of data available, you know, based on um, census um, and things of that nature. So, you know, according to LPC law, uh, the purpose of safeguarding these buildings and places that represent New York City's cultural, social, economic, political, and architectural history is to kind of foster civic pride, you know, stabilize and improve these property values, um, protect the the environment and um, New York City's attractions, 
uh, strengthen the economy and also promote the use of historic districts as education, um, pleasure and welfare for the people of the city. So um, the districts that I looked at um, I were primarily African-American residents um, initially. And they are all listed as that uh, being a significant contributing factor to this to the historic district. So not only were they, you know, very good architectural fabric, um, but they were also very prominent because of the African American culture and history of that of that place. So if we go to the next slide, again, I just started to look at um, these things within the within the, this context as I looked at these historic districts. So now that we're speaking about Harlem, if we go to the next slide, um, as I stated before, the Mount Morris Park Historic District, we have um, this location that's outlined in the red, which was nominated very early. Um, this was designated in 1971. And then in the blue outline, we have the area which was designated in 2015. And in the next slide, we can see um, more recently, we have the Central Harlem Historic District that was designated in two, 2018. So since these um, designations have taken place, if we go to the next slide, I started to analyze community changes, primarily before designation, um, and then halfway, and then the most current data that we could find. So reviewing the census data, there have been clear declines um, in the Black population in the neighborhoods, um, as well as the rental prices in the neighborhoods increasing astronomically compared to the rest of Manhattan. So three times more than the rest of Manhattan um, within a very short time frame. Um, within nine years, we, we see this significant jump um, of 37% increase. So we have a decline of minority population, which is the reason why these areas were designated in both reports, there are extensive um, commentary on the significance of the African-American history within the fabric and um, within the culture and kind of building up Harlem as a whole. So this was kind of really significant to see that kind of decline over time um, when this is what we're trying to preserve. And we can go to the next slide. So then we started to outline basically current, as I said, negative outcomes as a result of uh, preservation policy and its intersection on historic neighborhoods, uh, which, as we've discussed, are primarily lower income minority neighborhoods. Um, and as we began to analyze these outcomes, we can start to then discuss potential policy alternatives to offset these issues. So if we go to the last slide, we can see how you know, currently we talking about the rehab of property. Um, property remains in disrepair or homeowners sell if they can't afford to do this. And there's a lot of required maintenance of properties without proper funding or training. So it, you know, instead of giving such a harsh, um, you know, current outcome to this, we could be providing a lot of free programs and training for the maintenance and providing more flexible reviews for homeowners that are existing within the neighborhoods that have been there, you know, for extended, extended periods of time, as well as federal tax credits. Um, we kind of provide a lot of incentives for homeowners or developers, and there are no tax credits or grants, you know, provided to renters, so they remain disadvantaged, even though often they are the longest residents of the community. So we could find a way, you know, to provide tax credits for renters, renting to own programs, things of that nature, and more stringent requirements for investors um, and more lenient for existing lenders or existing tenants, excuse me. And then there's a lot of increased investor interest, as we've already discussed. Um, and there are multiple programs that currently benefit investors. So requiring developers to invest money into the neighborhood without profit um, for an extended period of time and also limiting the purchases of properties. Um, and businesses within one district would be very helpful instead of just um, allowing a lot of incentives to go towards development and things of that nature. And also the high increase of property values um, in comparison to other locations, even within Manhattan, um, increasing rent stabilization of homes, apartments, and businesses would be very helpful, as well as 
you know, funding opportunities for existing tenants and owners to invest prior to developers um, would be all, all be great alternatives that we should start looking into and building into policy to kind of combat certain issues that we see. And that's all I have. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions uh, and some answers. Uh, so those of you who have oh, and for those of you who have questions, uh, I'd uh, say you should uh, go to one There's of the mics, mics here, or, or is there one in the other side? Before we start off with the questions, thank you all so much. But just wanted to make an, a brief announcement. A brief announcement with regard to being conscious of the time um, so that we can get through. So if you can have your questions prepared when you come to the mic, that would help us out tremendously to help us move expeditiously through the rest of the programming so that we can stay on task for the next session. So thank you so much and be mindful. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is, how much of a role oh, did... State, state your name. Oh, sorry, I'm Keith <laughs> Taylor. Okay. Uh, my question is, how much of a role did disinvestment and things like redlining play in the preservation of housing stock in central Harlem over the years? And that's to whomever wants to answer it. Yeah. Kevin? Yes, he's still there. I mean, it, it created the challenge. That That's the point I was trying to make is yeah. that if you have, if you can't get loan money, for decades, then when it does become available, the condition of the homes is, you know, it's going to be a problem. So that's redlining all those things is a backdrop for a fair amount of the challenges. Mm -hmm. So it's a disincentive to invest if you, to be a part of an investing, it's a disincentive uh, to people who want to in, improve where they are. Um, and who would like to see a neighborhood that's preserved. It's, you, need, you need financing uh, to do those things. So anyway, okay, next, I'm sorry. I have a question, yes. Hi, my name is Jessica Morris. Um, I appreciate everything about today. And um, my question, Roberta, mm -hmm. is if you can field this and, mm -hmm. and, and try to find the right answer, mm. um, or any answer. Um, being contiguous mm. is an important, powerful condition of a district. Mm -hmm. um, I see, uh, and I've learned a lot already um, uh, through the work today, but it seems to be one of the, one of the aspects that um, is is missing in connecting these dots throughout Harlem, East Harlem. The power of being contiguous, say, in, in other historic districts that are untouchable mm -hmm. um, is because of that critical mass. Uh, and I think the location of buildings, what's left, mm -hmm. is something that um, needs to be connected without moving the buildings. How do you overcome that challenge of needing to be contiguous to, to sort of have that same power or, or gravitas? Is it through storytelling, uh, mm -hmm. like, like Marina kind of asks? Or how do we, how do we see that connection or understand um, where one district may lead to another, even though there's been erasure uh, in between? Once it's erased, it's difficult um, to... Um, sometimes uh, to bring it back. I mean, if, if, it's, if it is a historic building, it's a difficult task. Uh, at the same time, I think that um, one of the things um, that we looked at when um, Save Harlem Now looked at how to um, propose or find buildings that we think should be saved. Um, and, and yes, nothing is connected. Everything is like all over the place. Uh, but, um, you know, so it's not a historic district. We have choices. We can try to save buildings um, using the idea of um, historic, I mean, of historic districts. 
And that's, as I think we heard earlier today, that that's also sometimes tricky. Uh, but we work with what we have. And so when we find buildings that we believe deserve to be preserved, and it's not contiguous to anything else, then you look at how to um, persuade uh, LPC uh, to um, designate these buildings, even though they're not connected geographically um, to others, you still we still look at that as something as those buildings as important and an important part of the story. So there are some buildings that are together or are associated with each other, and others that aren't. But we think that they all deserve to be. If we think that they all deserve to be preserved then we have to use the tools that they have that are that are available and that results i think the result is what i just described where you can have districts with several, but they're both difficult to do but i think that we have to use them both because we want to capture as many of the surviving um, historic buildings as we can one way or the other I'm gonna add that um when Com Com um, columbia university students did the Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Um, when they did the study for the creation of a historic district and they settled on 116th Street in Pleasant, it was specifically because that's where all the um, surviving buildings were. And in East Harlem, it's a big mess. You got the con you know, mm -hmm. condos and empty lots and 107th, 106th from 3rd to Lexington is or was the only square block in East Harlem that had contiguous properties that were very similar or the same. So we're already like way too late. But like you said, you can do a district, but you could also do individual landmarking. When we say do, it's not like instantly do, but <laughs> you can work on that. <laughs> yes, um, Michael. Uh, well, I just wanted to respond to that in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission and preservationists in New York have not worried so much about that contiguous thing or even about whether buildings have been changed when it suits their purposes. Theodore Roosevelt's house had been demolished and it was just completely recreated and tourists go there all the time. Same with Francis Tavern. Early on, in several instances, Historic preservation in New York was used in this wonderful way in Harlem, such as its Driver's Row and um, at Sylvan Place. And in both of those instances, the commission designated these houses mm -hmm. with the idea that they were going to use federal money to effect a restoration in both places. So money was given to the owners of houses on Driver's Row to... Um, do renovation work in the 1970s, I think it was. And the same thing with the designation of uh, Sylvan Terrace um, up by the Morris Jamel Mansion. The Lewis Latimer House, when it was designated, it was moved from its original location. It had been covered in aluminum siding and had an addition made to it and had its front porch closed in. And yet, it was designated with the idea the designation would help to affect its restoration. So, when you look, you know, at something like um, the Tiffany Building on Fifth Avenue, the um, McKimmead and White Tiffany Building, its columns had been encased in like these boxes, and the Landmarks Commission designated it anyhow. The um, um, there's a food, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a shoe store um, in the Ladies' Mile, and it had a terrible alteration to it, but it's a beautiful building because it has these, um, on, on the second story, it has these relief sculptures by Alexander Calder that show famous actresses in their famous roles from the 1920s because they shopped at that store. 
And despite the change, this building was protected by landmarking anyhow. So we can't listen to them say this crap about, oh, well, it's been too changed, or oh, no, it, it's not um, intact enough. Oh, no, it, it doesn't have authenticity or integrity. It has the history, and the history and development and preservation can all be used to affect restoration and rehabilitation. Okay. Uh, but we should also just remember that LPC, it may be designating, has the power to designate and not, but the money does not come with that designation from them. And I'm just talking about like in the case of Astor Row, it was other organizations That's and true, other people who gave the money. Terrace, yes. They had a block grant from HUD and the Landmarks Preservation Commission themselves gave the money right after the designation. And even now they have some kind of fund, I think, that um, homeowners who are in need can apply for. It's sort of like with affordable housing, the developers come to your community and or your city um, agencies and they say, no, we can't afford that. We can't afford this. We can't afford that. But we do know that property owners can do whatever they want, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in t terms of affordable housing. So we should not take no for an answer. Absolutely. Okay, Simeon. Hi, uh, Simeon Bankoff. I'd actually like to, this is to Tiffany and um, anybody else who'd like to talk about this. You were talking about the way that uh, designation could lead to owner and uh, in sort of in, uh, additional investment in an area. However, I've seen studies that show immediately outside of historic districts is where you get the worst kind of community destroying um, investments because they get to look at the pretty old buildings mm -hmm. uh, without any kind of control on them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see this abundantly in the very large Park Slope Historic District, um, all around it has been completely devastated and uh, a huge community of color has been actually aggressively removed from it uh, in order to build up uh, large new buildings that have no, have a different zoning underlying and mm -hmm. no, no controls. So can uh, you sort of talk about that a little bit with regards to what you were saying earlier about uh, preservation controls coming in and messing up a neighborhood. Absolutely. Um, everything that you've, you've just mentioned is true. Um, we've seen that a lot, not only um, in Brooklyn, as you mentioned, in Park Slope. Um, we've seen that in Harlem, especially because we have um, uh, the, I'm forgetting the name of the district on the west side, basically where Columbia University comes up. Then we have Mount Morris and Central Harlem. And then we have the proposed, well, proposed East Harlem on the west, uh, on the east side. Um, but we have a lot of buildup specifically between Columbia and um, Mount Morris Park and Central Harlem, a lot from Columbia themselves um, and from a lot of investors doing, you know, student housing. Um, I mean, hideous, just box buildings that um, have no um, limits on height as well, which plays a huge factor, um, not only in the current landscape, but, you know, what, what that is doing to the historic districts in terms of lighting, um, you know, aesthetics, um, things like that. So that's definitely um, a huge factor because once you know that a historic district is, you know, there protected, it's going to remain intact, um, nice. It's going to have these different investment opportunities. So someone who, you know, is kind of in that, that middle class can go right to the perimeter um, kind of do what they want, build up a lot, and have quick access to a lot of what's going to be happening in that historic district as well, um, which ideally, you know, we're, we're doing this so that we maintain the historic fabric, but as we know, that increases property values. So, you know, you're there, but you're, you're not there. So, again, the lower income residents get pushed out of those locations as well. Um, that's correct. That's um, mm. a, a huge issue. Okay. Thank you, Samir. Oh, okay. Sorry, the other side. I've been waiting patiently. Your I'm name? Marcus Howard. Uh, definitely a pleasure uh, to have you all speak today. Um, my question kind of goes to Mrs. Semple. Can you uh, say? Can you just state your name again? Uh, Marcus Howard. Uh, so, for my question, it's more go more so geared towards the outcomes that you mentioned in your presentation around gentrification, uh, specifically around the federal tax uh, tax infrastructure. Um, and I guess my question is more so around the rent to own opportunity for residents. Um, has that been explored uh, specifically within New York City and also just other models within other uh, states and uh, districts? For example, Washington, D.C., where residents of buildings have the power to uh, 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, kind of take ownership of their building if it's in a space uh, in place in which they're able to kind of retain ownership as a collective body. So I guess my question is, has it been explored? What does that look like for New York City, potentially for Harlem? And are there other examples that have successfully did that of renting to own from uh, from renters or from uh, those who are home buyers? And kind of what would that look like in New York City? Yeah, um, I haven't seen that done in, in New York City yet. Um, I have seen, especially in Harlem, because once the initial Mount Morris Park District was designated, um, Harlem had been kind of abandoned at that point. Um, you know, we weren't, the government was, wasn't putting any money into the neighborhood. As we talked about, it was kind of red lines. Everyone moved out um, and the jobs were, were scarce. Um, and they were just, you know, kind of building up additional housing and not really putting any money into businesses or things like that that would help the, the neighborhood. So I know that when that was designated, um, people that were actually on Mount Morris Park West, there were several buildings there that people that were living there could literally buy their apartments within those buildings for $300. So if you had, you know, a little bit of cash on you at that time, like you've come up crazy. But um, in terms of like telling people, hey, you know, giving them information on these programs, if they, you know, didn't know anything about it. Um, a lot of that has lagged behind um, in the city and um, in general. I think these are kind of little secret things and, and secret programs you have to dig into. And there just have not been, has not been enough education um, on these programs that are available. And I have not seen it put to um, a larger use in, in the context of New York City at all. Thank you. And I guess uh, part two for my question, if that's okay, um, what would be, I guess, the impetus for organizations of preservationists uh, for community members? What would be the impetus for them to get involved and kind of understand how to advocate for those type uh, laws or changes uh, on the books? I think that as soon as a historic district is, you know, about to be nominated, we, we have a timeline, you know, people are allowed to put in petitions, the community board can discuss. I think that you know, we should push back on, on LPC and whoever and say, hey, you know, before we we move forward with this approval, we want to give the residents a chance, you know, let's give them a couple of open courses on, you know, programs that are available to existing residents so they can take advantage of these things before other people swoop in. I think that would be a huge benefit, um, especially now. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Other questions? I'd like to yes. disabuse everyone of the notion that it was easy for people to buy an apartment for two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was not that simple. No. Okay. <laughs> the buildings went into a program. It was called TIL, the Tenant Interim Lease Program. Okay, and the tenants had to maintain their properties with inadequate funding. Okay. They weren't given the funds to build a capital reserve to repair the roof or to make plumbing repairs, to do any of those sorts of things. And they were supposed to work on forming a cooperative mm -hmm. uh, 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 structure. Yeah. And if that didn't happen, which oftentimes it did not happen, the buildings were taken back by the city. The city is still doing that so that those individuals who fought hard in those properties for 10, 20 years, working towards home ownership, mm -hmm. weren't actually given that opportunity. They remained renters or they were removed from the property. Those properties were turned over to developers to renovate and rent out. So let's, I don't, I don't want any of you to think that it was that simple, and we just wasted opportunities to purchase property within our own community. Yeah, uh, you should identify yourself, but also, help, hi. But also, uh, there are there is um, I know of a building now that's done by um, that's being developed by a not for profit, um, and um, now it's not well, it's not three hundred dollars. It's like two thousand something, um, and few of them can do that, can raise that money now. Um, but a few are doing it, and I'm just saying that it's 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 a hard, uh, it's a very hard uh, road to follow. How how do you do that? So even though it looks like a dream amount of money uh, to most folks, 
uh, $2,000 to get an apartment. I mean, is it 2,500? What? Oh, no, then, oh, 250 then, yeah. Uh, so, no, she was just saying it was $250 at that time. Correct, yeah, 1983. Right, I remember that, yeah. Uh, and some of those people were living, I think it, because I think the building, one of the buildings I'm thinking about was one of those buildings then, too. And, and it's only been like in the last year. It's a building on our, our block um, that is, um, yeah. And so some people, some few people are, are saying that they're coming back and that they have the 2,000 now. Anyway, but it's a, it's a really hard road. And um, that's not like uh, something that we can just say is taken for granted, you know, that you can do it. Yeah, um, earlier I referenced uh, community land trusts and Cooper Square on uh, w uh, East 4th Street is, is the model that they were able to successfully um, basically hold on to almost an entire block, even if not more. And they are tenant owners, and they manage and run and own their own built, you know, their own units. And they've been able to raise children there that can afford to stay there. Uh, but what the city's been doing now lately with the failed till buildings is trying to turn them over to um, wannabe CLTs, okay, community land trusts, because they're not letting the model that they're enforcing upon the land trusts all over the city, people are trying to create that. The model, the legal model, they're, they're forcing them to go through in order for any funding is not tenant owned. So it's like till improved or tw till 2.0. So what's the point of that? So every time we try something, they say, no, you can't. And what did Michael say? Yes, we can, right? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? For us, for this panel, panel two. Okay. Hmm? Uh, well, uh, there. yes, yes, uh, we have time. But if there aren't any questions. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, are there things that we as a panel, uh, other issues that you've heard someone else on the panel discuss that you'd like to? Um, well, Bring one thing I, I'd like, one point I'd like to make is that um, my answer to that first question probably gave the impression that everything is rosy in terms of housing finance. Um, the 1968 Fair Housing Act supposedly outlawed discrimination in housing and lending, but every year statistics come out that show when you control for credit, people of color are denied mm -hmm. loans at much higher rates than white people with similar backgrounds. And so this isn't just in the past, these issues about access to financing. It's mm -hmm. here now, yeah. even though on paper, it looks like a, a even playing field, but it's not. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's why we have a Wells Fargo where Lennox Lounge used to be. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Other comments? Okay, there's, okay, this is, that's a good question. That's a longer discussion. Let us see how we, how short we can make it. Uh, what, so go ahead. We need a lot of pro bono legal support, <laughs> number one. Um, but yeah, persistence and actions, you know, I, I really strongly believe in, in people actions um, and calling your electeds and whoever is, has that power, you know, calling them out. Uh, calling them out publicly, not just in closed meetings. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a simple solution. It's, you know, rarely works, but you have to try something. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think um, participating in organizations or starting organizations, um, not just this, you know, we're not just saying just everything or everyone should join Safe Harlem now, but start your own or, or work with an existing organization. Um, or put together a coalition. Yes, yes. And I think that these kinds of meetings could be the start of some types of coalitions because we need to understand who else is uh, working in the area, in the field and how we, what we do can relate to what others do 
and how we can multiply our efforts uh, to make it something meaningful. And that even like just coming to a session like this today is an opportunity to both think of ways that if you're part of an organization, how that organization um, could maybe possibly advance based on something that you saw or heard here today. Um, and it's also about uh, personal relationships and, and, and that opportunities and more opportunities to hear what other people are trying to do and to find ways to get connected can lead to a better final product. Be, beware of those coalitions though. Like with everything, you have to ask who's doing it and mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. and who's right. gonna ultimately benefit. We have another question. Okay. Um, oh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. My name is Donna Keel. I'm a, a Harlem resident. Okay. I'm up by Jackie Robinson Park. Um, and I was trying to think of it when I think Tiffany was speaking. There was a, an article I had read, this was now back in the spring, of an organization called Urban Homesteading Assistance Board. Mm -hmm. It had a, Okay, and they had assisted um, a, a small, a small, small five, some tenants in a small five-story building in the Bronx and eventually going from tenants to owners. Um, and it was a very amazing story to me because these were all very ordinary, everyday folk, mm -hmm. you know, in whatever their situations, and they had been able over a, a, a lengthy process, it looked like, go from tenants where our building was about to be taken from underneath them to owners. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I didn't know much about it and I didn't know if anyone here knew much more about it or their efforts or if there had been any success stories of this kind. Mm -hmm. And where was that? What street? Was uh, uh, 700 East 134th Street. Um, it was, the building was sold to a nonprofit urban you have um, and they were able to assist, I think it was about seven or 21, 20 some odd residents in buying their own building mm -hmm. um, so that they can have for themselves. And they were a despair group. Of, there was a nurse, there was um, a mother of a child with disabilities, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a range of folks, you know, not super high income. Mm -hmm. Maybe Curtis knows more about that program. <laughs> and Curtis, there's actually one on, on uh, our block, 132nd Street, that building uh, two doors down. Uh, for me, um, where they are trying to do that. Um, Curtis, do you want to? Do you want to address or respond? No. <laughs> okay. It was Valerie's idea. I didn't say I was I'll get you, Valerie. Uh, so my name is Curtis Archer. And as you all know, I'm with Harlem Community Development Corporation, a state agency under Empire State Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. I've been, I'm originally, as you know, Kevin, you know I'm originally from what? The BX, baby. <laughs> yeah. But I've been a Harlemite since 1980. And so I moved into my uh, apartment in, uh, in 1980, uh, but it went co-op uh, under that program mm -hmm. that uh, Regina mentioned, Till, and it became an HDFC co-op in 1983. So yes, at that particular time, I was able to acquire it at the uh, unheard of price of $250. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right in terms of it, and most of the properties that went through the program being undercapitalized, because there were a number of problems in these pre-war buildings that were never, ever addressed. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, thank God we're still holding on. We actually, as a matter of fact, I have to say that sometimes uh, you're in there and, and you don't realize whatever, there are a lot of things that you have to take care of because you go from, let's say, a landlord building to now self-management. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in terms of addressing a number of the uh, uh, deficiencies in the building, and one of the things is that, you know what, you are not gonna have that same, let's say, maintenance fee forever. Right. Yes. So now we're getting ready for a big hit, but it's a needed hit of about 15%. <laughs> like you say, ooh, that's a lot. Yes, it is a lot, but uh, quite necessary if you've been skating by for a number of years without any increase. Mm -hmm. So if you see that program through HPD mm -hmm. and also that particular organization you have, very, very beneficial because they mm -hmm. held our hand through the process 15. of self-management for a number of years. Okay. Wow. And they have also some great courses as well. For those who, who may be just getting into the program of an HDFC, I highly recommend it. Yeah, and I, I want to add also the HDC, Historic Districts Council, for people who want to learn about that, offers low cost or free courses. And I believe you have also has uh, uh, services that they provide in terms of training to the community. Okay, yes, Michael. Something that Mr. Walker did that was really one of the greatest gifts 
through the United States and its history is when the Detroit Institute of Art was in danger of having all of its great treasures sold away, he got together a consortium of foundations and they created a, oh, thank you. They created a fund to rescue that museum so that it can survive. And perhaps it's too ambitious, but couldn't Save Harlem Now help initiate something like that in terms of uh, housing in Harlem and particularly in terms of uh, the many, many um, buildings which are affordable housing in terms of ha already being rent regulated and in terms of creating opportunities for home ownership and in terms of buildings which should be landmarked but haven't been. Because, you know, when you look on the boulevards of uh, Harlem, on Lenox Avenue, on 7th Avenue, on Broadway, there is a greater repository of real affordable housing in these rent-regulated buildings than they would ever be able to recreate and at a much greater magnitude than anything that they offer today and call affordable housing. And so uh, it would seem to me that these sorts of extraordinary measures are the kind of um, inventive thinking that we need to sustain our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other comments? Is, is Simeon still here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, you may know about, uh, you may know, I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but in terms of SHPO and, and um, getting money uh, for federal projects, right, um, how can that be integrated into um, groups, integrated into the programs that uh, groups like Save Harlem Now um, ha has going on? So, very, very briefly, um, the State Historic Preservation Office um, manages it manages the uh, federal and New York State uh, historic rehabilitative tax credits, mm -hmm. which are only available at the moment to property owners. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they're also uh, uh, available to commercial owners, and that's a situation where by going through a voluntary uh, voluntary uh, and, and kind of a uh, paperwork intensive mm. situation, you can get, um, I believe it's 20% off of the cost of a re rehabilitation project off of your property taxes. Mm -hmm. And that can, um, and there might even be a situation where you can sort of maybe even double that or add to that through the federal. And um, that will uh, permit you to take it off your property taxes and you can also uh, extend that out over five years. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office loves this program and is always more than happy to do uh, free workshops mm -hmm. with community members because uh, they need to keep this program active in order for it to get refunded. Mm -hmm. So um, it is work intensive and you do, but it's completely voluntary. Uh, so that's one good thing to do. There's also, I mean, just touching on what Michael was talking about, um, there are situations like the Landmarks Preservation Commission does have a community block development funds mm -hmm. that they uh, constantly get into trouble with at the city budget because the uh, New York City doesn't understand how federal money works. Um, but they do give money uh, to into the, as, as a grant mm -hmm. to not-for-profits and to um, people of income-limited basis uh, for facade improvements. I believe Alice and Agate Court, which are too small, which is a small historic district in Bed-Stuy, like 75% of the homeowners in this small enclave got about $20,000 on average to fix up their mm -hmm. facades. And that was just like straight out grant money, uh, which is really great. Um, a lot of the grant monies that come from government also are based around census tracts. So you need to show 
what the income level is in your census tract versus the average income level within other census tracts. Again, the State Historic Preservation Office really wants you to use this, so they, they're willing to kind of nudge numbers around. Those are, those are you know, very easy educational ways to get people in touch with, um, with the agencies. Uh, and then again, as as uh, you know, as Michael was saying, there are innovative ways. There's uh, less and less so now that large banks have really kind of metastasized, and there really aren't local banks as much anymore. But you could potentially, you know, talk to a credit union and create a situation where, with the work of a local credit union, or um, get uh, in, involve yourself with. Um, very uh, beneficial rates on mortgages or loans. The, the Landmarks Conservancy, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, also has a, has a low yes, or yeah. no interest loan program for grants, and they also um, have a small, uh, just give, those are for homeowner grants to individuals. They also have a small uh, amount of money for uh, emergency grants for organizations. Um, and Ann Friedman, who I saw was here earlier, and she might, might still be, uh, she works with uh, sacred sites throughout the state. So she uh, has all sorts of great ideas. And, and my colleague, Andrew Goldwyn from the Lammers Conservancy, use, um, is intimately familiar with that, so bother Andrea about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, as uh, smaller groups trying to uh, do this work on our own, I mean, we should be aware of all of the things that are available to us so that um, we can make it, uh, make it an easier process in terms of taking advantage of what money there is, even if it's not where we're expecting it to be. Other, um, other comments or questions? Yes, I just wanted to. Oh. I just want to say that not even a hundred people have used uh -huh. the investment tax credit in Harlem. Okay, well, I guess I know one percent or half a percent for someone. Uh, huh? Say that again. What's your referring to? The opportunity zone or tax credit? No. The federal and state <coughs> investment <coughs> tax credit. Maybe that's something Safe Harlem now could do is try to put together some workshops to help people understand yeah. how to do it. Yeah. yeah, because there is some money there. Yes. Okay. A question. Some here. So. Can partner with us uh -huh. to do that. Obviously, people need some help trying to understand how to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. One other question, or I guess our last yeah. question. HDFC, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, HDFCs, um, and Curtis referred to them, and I'm sure there are experts in the room at you know the Columbia University real estate professors, et cetera, but um, there are over 200 HDFCs mm. buildings in West Harlem mm -hmm. alone. They have more than the entire borough of Queens and Staten Island, I think, and Brooklyn put together. And uh, they were born out of a bankruptcy in New York when all the landlords kind of uh, gave their buildings and walked away to New York City. New York City couldn't afford to, uh, take the, to take them over and maintain them. So they said to the owners of the building, you know, we'll do what we can. But if you guys maintain them over decades, then you can take ownership to it, graduate into sort of a co-op uh, process. Um, it isn't necessarily in the tenant's best interest to go into a co-op because then they would be 100% responsible, including for capital improvements, and that would be very, very expensive. Nonetheless, they want to retain ownership having, having, after having decades of investment into those buildings. And there are some buildings that are kind of choosing to go the co-op route. But now that the most expensive thing in New York is what? Real estate? Mm -hmm. The city's starting to put the squeeze on a lot of these buildings and says, you know what? You're in distress and we're going to take these buildings back. Guess why? <laughs> in order to potentially knock them down and privatize them, mm -hmm. give them to developers. This is already happening. It's happening all over our district in particular. And we know that that's happening. And there's uh, something called the HDFC Coalition. You could look that up. And they're advocates for... Somebody said, uh, is there anything we could do with the law? Yes, there are HDFC-related laws, and you've got to lobby. Now, I, I just want to bring this up because somebody said, how do we do this politically? I used to be a chair of a community board, and all the zoning in the district has to come through. You're the community board, and you can either say yes, no, or yes with conditions. And 
um, like for example, you know, we were talking about zoning, you know, 197A pro, uh, uh, plans, which are the rezoning of an entire district. You can do contextual zoning as has been done in East Harlem and has been done in Central Harlem or, you know, an entire district rezoning. And, 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 and somebody was talking about also, somebody mentioned how to, uh, you know, envision how you want your community to look in the future. And, you know, somebody said, isn't that too restrictive? Not at all, because you basically can say, you know what, in this block, we can go up 10 stories. That's fine there because it would be contextual to the other buildings that are there and so on and so forth. This is something that really is a all hands on deck, elected officials, community leaders. Everybody has to agree on it when it ultimately happens. But HDFCs are very vital, in my opinion, because and because if, if they can create generational wealth for families who've been living check to check for all these years and holding down those buildings. And sometimes, you know, the, the politics and, um, and developers are trying to take those buildings away from them. If they can somehow purchase, you know, the building, you know, get it to where they own the building, those apartments are now worth, there's nothing in Harlem worth under what, half a million dollars these days? So families who've been struggling, if they can buy into those apartments and they could create potentially a co-op program out of those buildings, they can then be worth, like they can create generational wealth in a very, very short amount of time. They can choose to stay there, to send their kids to any schools they want. A lot of the financial restrictions, they would have build equity. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really important program that people should look into in our community there are some, I just want to say, there's some loopholes, right? Because there are salary restrictions on them. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding, and this is very, you got to be very keen on this, right? Parents might underwrite a child's $80,000 income. So in other words, for example, people who sell their apartments on the Upper West Side, right? They have millions of dollars. They, they, uh, their child is an artist, wants a three-bedroom apartment up in Harlem, I, I qualify because I only make eighty thousand dollars, but you're being bankrolled by your parents co-signing. So it's it's very tricky, and that's how a lot of the gentrification is happening. And I think that legislation needs to be um, legislation needs to be clarified to ensure that people from the community who've struggled Benefit. through all the difficult times in the community are the ones who are retained in the community, and we prevent gentrification that way as okay. well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And uh, Roberta, mm -hmm. thank you for moderating this session and the panelists that were on session two. We are most appreciative for your time and your expertise and sharing your knowledge with us today. Before we transition, however, into the next session, I do have one suggestion um, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, we're going to do what we're calling a digital suggestion box. So I'm going to give you the mobile number for Save Harlem Now. And then you can set text to us your suggestions right here, real time, right now, if you have any. That's one option. The other option is, as we go into our break, there's going to be pencil and pad out there for you to write down your thoughts, your suggestion that you want to leave with us. We'll codify that information and share it with the uh, guests that are here today, and then make some plans around some of these great suggestions that have emerged in this space, such that we can move from talking and move into action, yeah? So I'm going to give you the uh, mobile number here now if, for those of you who want to do it digitally and those of you who want to do it the old-fashioned way, pen and paper, right, you can do it that way as well. So um, my, the Save Harlem Now number is going to be 332-259-2500. I'll read it again. Three three two two five nine six one two three, and you can text your suggestions, your thoughts, your comments there to our digital suggestion box, or you have the option once you exit for your break to write it down, and we'll collect the information there. One more time. Yes, ma'am. Certainly. Number? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that number is going to be three three two two five nine. Six one two three, 
and now everybody has the telephone number for the executive director for Save Harlem Now. <laughs> so there's no reason for you all not to be in touch and keep in touch, all right? All right, so we're going to adjourn here for our break, and then the pencils, the pads are over there for those of you who want to um, write your suggestions. But thank you so much, and we'll reconvene for our last and final session um, at 3.30. So enjoy your break, and I'll see you back here soon. Thank you. <laughs>